Thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Write Project podcast and radio program. This is a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew, author of such novels as Touch Your Nose and Jacoby Street and founder of Engine Books. Let's see what we have today. Well, thank you for joining us for another very special episode of the Right Project podcast. I know that I say that they are all special, but this one really is. We have the acclaimed, amazing author and activist Gemma Hickey on the line, uh, the author of Almost Feral 2019 from Breakwater Books, and was a contributing author to Land of Many Shores, my favorite read so far in 2022, also from Breakwater Books, edited by Ainsley Hawthorne. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me on the podcast, Gemma. Such a pleasure, Matthew. Thanks so much for having me. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, first off the bat, I read through uh, Land of Many Shores. I shouldn't say I read through it like it was a chore or something. I absolutely adored it. Um, Your story, House, is pretty early in the collection, and I can see why. It really kind of, like, tugs at the heartstrings and makes a... um, uh, it, it. it's a wonderful, wonderful tale uh, of like just how important it is. In my, in my, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but just how important it is to have a loved one that's supportive of you. To me, that's that's what it's about. Can you talk about that story at all? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm a memoirist, and I, because it's about parts of my own life, I try to make the story relatable to to everyone really it's uh, not just a story about someone who's transitioning um it's really about the broader picture and about how we're changing and evolving and, and how just because we're born a certain way doesn't mean that we can't become who we want to be and so i use the analogy of a house and brought in my grandparents and their first house and how when they moved into the house it was really really not a great house I mean it was broken down it was there was no running water no electricity and they raised their family of nine in the house and they lived in the house for for all of their lives um up to the point when they got married and um from the point on where they got married I I believe actually yes so they were young they were a young couple Uh, They already had a couple of kids in another house. They were renting from the church and they were renting this one from the church. Um, And they just, they eventually bought it off the church when they had money. Um, And then they turned the house into what they wanted it to be. They turned the house into a home. And so I was trying to give readers the idea that just because I was born in this body, I'm, I'm learning how to live in it. Yeah. And, um, and so you know, that that whole idea of home and family, I wanted to weave that in there and focusing on my grandmother specifically because she was a pretty cool person. Um, And, you know, some of the discussions that we had, um, you know, just because I wanted people to know that even though people were born from different generations, doesn't mean that they're um, ignorant or they can't understand. Or even if you're, you know, growing up, I I grew up in a a devout Irish uh, Roman Catholic family and, and, um, you know, very, very Catholic. And so just because you were raised in a certain um, religious denomination doesn't necessarily mean that you're, um, you have to stay stuck in those types of beliefs. So there's movement in the story <clears throat> in that people can change, not just me who's transitioning, but also those around me. So we're transitioning together. I like that. I liked it a lot. I love the analogy of the the house and, and, constant i don't know it, it was very inspirational like yeah constant renovations and improvement i have some stuff i'd like to renovate i'm pointing it up my gut right now you know what i mean like there's there's plenty of stuff i'd like to to rehaul and stuff like that uh your grandmother the 
character in air quotes because it's a, a memoir you know what i mean or a memoirist um well she, she was a character for sure That's, yeah 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 <laughs> uh i love the air quotes character of your grandmother uh she seems or seems seemed or seemed i'm not sure if she's still with us unbelievably cool um and and it really it's, it's always funny to me how like um like there's the author's intent with a story and then there's what the reader gleans from it like readers from different backgrounds and and stuff like that especially to me it's a what i've read into it was it and this is not what you intended at all i already know that but like to me it's a story about ageism and i know that's bizarre to say but hear me out i i hear the defense a lot when people are of a certain age are ignorant that oh it's just the, the time they came from you know what i mean like this path like you you get to not update your firmware i say you know what i mean like society's sending you an update and you're just clicking later for 20 years and i'm like no you know what that does a big disservice to people of of many generations going very far back who were not homophobic who were not transphobic who were not sexist who were not racist who were not whatever the ist is like like just like there are buttholes now there are were buttholes then and you can't just br paint with a broad brush and say everyone your grandmother's age is ignorant because they're not and and i i feel like a lot of times um uh, people who don't want to to learn and grow use that as a that's their later button they say that's just when i was bored and click later you know yeah no no those are really good points i think if someone who reads the story can take something away from it um like that then that's great i mean my story is doing what it was meant to do um <clears throat> accessibility readability, you know, that kind of thing. That's what I wanted. Um, even though I'm talking about, um, you know, I could get more theoretical um, or academic, but I really wanted to uh, apply the storytelling that I grew up with and also, um, you know, reach into not only people's minds, but their hearts as well. And, um, and just show that there's movement. There's movement. We don't have to stay stuck in anything really, you know, and I think for me, because I identify as non-binary, that um, people think there's always a transition, an end, an end point to a transition, but there's not, not with me, you know, I was, I'm still navigating in between a binary, that's very difficult, uh, and carving out that space and what that space looks like, you know, which has been these last uh, number of years, what my advocacy work has been focused on in, in many ways, but that, you know, we're, trans we're transitioning as a society um, and, you know, we don't have to stay stuck. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, that's important for people to, to know because, you know, growing up, I was of the belief that there was something wrong with me because of my sexuality. And, you know, I hadn't even tackled gender identity at that time because there was no language for me. So I just thought it was either gay or lesbian because I liked girls, you know, and um, even though I always felt like more like a boy, um, but there was no, there were no resources. There were no people out there I could look to. I didn't even know the word transgender existed, you know, and, and I was born in the seventies. So, you know, again, for me, it's been a continual process of embracing my identity and that's been shifting. And I explore that theme in my uh, memoir, Almost Feral, um, as I'm walking, you know, from one side of the island to the other side, I say of myself, because really, I explore all those things that inform my identity growing up, you know, growing up on an island, um, being an islander, and, and growing up Roman Catholic, and um, the struggle between gay and straight, the struggle between male, female, like all, what, do, what do all these things mean? And where do, exactly do I fit in? Where do we all fit in? Um, you know, so I think um, I've been playing with this theme of identity for quite some time um, and, you know, putting it to, putting pen to papers is uh, part of that process for me. 
I, I don't think you can call the level at which you write playing at anything. Like it's it's masterclass kind of stuff from, from what I've been reading of your stuff. I, I must say I don't have almost feral. I've read it. Uh, I've read it while waiting at the library as, uh, and and kind of like skim through. But it's on my to be read list to get it uh, entirely. But it's masterful writing. Oh, thank um, you so much. No, yeah, yeah. And a lot of ways, like. Uh, uh, there, there's sometimes the it's not even just from what I understand and you can you know yell at me and I'll leave it in because I don't mind being yelled at but sometimes it's not even just even conflicting with gender identity sometimes it's a matter of like the societal constructs around gender identity like so much of what we classify as being that that binary is just made up by society that that like 1911 I was reading um um, what's it called? I was reading a post the other day, and there was an excerpt from uh, Peter Pan and Wendy, uh, that that children's book from from 1911, uh, and it was really weird culturally because it was describing the fairies and the different colors, and it said, and there was a, a section in it where it talked about there were um, boy fairies and girl fairies, and also sillies who were a little bit of both kind of thing. But yeah. what's it like and like and they called them sillies, which is both infantile but also very cute for a children's yeah. book. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, God bless them for even putting that in there in 1911. Um, but like the interesting thing to me was the color coding of it because I think it was um, boys were ma, all the boy fairies were mauve, uh, all of the girl fairies were white, and all of the silly fairies were blue. And the note on the end of the post was. Just so you realize, this is before society constructed the pink is for girls, blue is for boys dynamic. And I mean, that's not that long ago. You know what I mean? Like 1911 is like, I don't think there's anyone alive now that was alive in 1911, but it's not that far outside of living memory. Like these constructs that we think of as being there forever just weren't. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, no, for sure. And again, you know, movement, change, shifting. Um, as we learn and grow, you know, and, and, and I think that's really, really important. And that's something that we can all relate to and <clears throat> explore, you know, on this journey that we call life, uh, being a bit of abstract there now, but it's true. I mean, in a way, um, <clears throat> you know, it's nothing is clear to me anymore. I'm, I'm living my answers and um, it's been a wild ride. I'm living my answers. That is, that's a cool sentence that I'm going to have a long think about. Um, is that something you came with just on the spot or is that, uh, is that something you say? You know, um, that's, I think that's something on the spot um, based on our discussion. Um, maybe you've been my muse this morning and I'm coming up with some thoughts here. I don't know, but anyway, I like it. I like where it's going. I like that. I like I'm living my answers. That's that's something that seems so clear cut, but has like it, there's layers to that. That's that's mm. that's genius. Um, yeah, I'm embarrassed. Like, uh, but cards on the table. My own embarrassment level. It took me. So we were talking before about. Um, oh, we were mentioning like the binary kind of thing, uh, 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 or the the perceived binary of gender. It and and you were saying how you were um you were non-binary and that it like it's the, the that the transition's always ongoing to you. Sorry, it took me a second to remember what you'd said, but um, uh, it took me an embarrassingly long time and my to that's the one hurdle because I am a not just with gender but like I'm a very like binary thinker and it's something that's taken me. To, even with like say arguments or something like that like you're either with me or you're against me or you're this or you're that something that uh that that took me some therapy and stuff like that to try and get out of because it's not healthy you know what i mean like no, almost nothing is binary but that's the thing that took me uh the longest part to get over to be like no like like crap's not binary you know what i mean like not nothing is binary least of all gender you know um and i think that's important i think that it's it's important to recognize when we ourselves have had a firmware update and not just like it, it would be easy for for someone to go no i've always had it right you know what i mean i'm like no that that 
took me a while and and I might have been a crappy person for a little while unintentionally. You know what I mean? It's like, and I'm sure there'll be firmware updates in the future. And that that reminder that I need those stops me from clicking later. You know what I mean? When I make when I encounter new information. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's important. Um, you know, I'm an advocate and I, I talk about these sorts of things uh, when I give talks. Um, it's a large part of my advocacy work, but I think it's really important for people who don't really understand to figure that out on their own and to not make it about them as, as such, to not bring it into the conversation every time they meet someone who's transgender or who identifies as non-binary, but just to have that kind of, um, well, to do the research. Everything is so readily available now. And if there's a question, you can Google it, you know? Um, but I think that's really important, especially for people who, you know, I mean, I'm 45 years old. So I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time um, living in my body, working through my issues, talking with a therapist from time to time, you know? Um, and this is my my work you know i've been doing this now for over two decades with with advocacy work so you know these types of conversations i can have not all the time but you know when i feel um i want to talk about it or respond i will not a lot of people uh can do that so i think it's important and i'm glad you brought it up actually about you know some of the things that you still have to struggle with in terms of being tracked within this binary as well but that you know, pronouns often come up as as a as a a point uh, where people get stuck on, and I think it's important that people, even if they don't understand, it's not up to to you to really understand or even verbalize the fact that you don't understand to someone who is uh, transgender or non-binary, uh, however anyone identifies. Yeah. Um. But it's up for you know, you have to respect what the person wants. And so generally I say to people, if you don't understand the pronoun, you make a mistake, just move on. Just like yeah. what the person wants and then correct yourself and move on. Don't make a big deal out of it. It doesn't have to be like this awkward moment where there's like, feels like there's flashing lights and alarms going off or, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. want to, then it's just, you made a mistake. You just correct it and then move on. And then if you have any questions or, you figure that out on your own, but yeah. you know, it's, it can be exhausting for people um, to have, to have the same sorts of discussions over again, you know, talking about genitals, not cool, not appropriate, you know, no. questions like that. It's, it's not okay to, to bring anything like that up. Like people don't normally have those types of conversations. So why is, why is that a topic of conversation with transgender people? You know? So I think it's just, you know, respect, um, boundaries and and just you know human decency basically common sense uh oh. these are things that people need to apply when they're when they're when they're connecting with uh trans folks and and you know uh again pronouns you have to respect the person's pronouns even if you don't understand you know yeah. it's just deal with it move on yeah there's a, a like I, I love there's a, a quote from neil degrasse tyson uh who i who i enjoy um that I love when he's dealing with, with regards to science in general, um, ignorant people or or people that kind of chafe up against him and stuff like that. When they're like, "Well, I don't understand," and then they, you know, state their their argument kind of thing. Uh, I love his quote: "The universe is under no obligation to make itself understood by you," or something like that. And I'm like, "Yeah." That's nice that you don't understand. I'm not obligated to make you <laughs> like, like you. You not understanding doesn't change anything <laughs> about the yeah, situation. Like, you know, I'm not everyone's teacher. Um, no, trans folks, gay and lesbian folks, they're not everyone's teacher. Um, I think exhausting. Well, it can be, but yeah. again, for me as an advocate, and this is my life's work. Essentially, I, you know, I'm I'm fine to have those discussions, but I definitely say to people you know what i'm not feeling this discussion right now let's move on to another topic i've done that I've di i did it over christmas yeah, absolutely um, you know with some family members yeah and I, they respected that yeah can i ask you a question on that subject of being on an, an advocate and stuff like that if it's okay and again so what's it i i know what it's like to have turned 
my hobby, pre what started as a hobby and an art and a passion writing into a job. And it's rough sometimes because, very, it be, and it's not on the same level, but like that, that like taking something that you used to do to, be, to relax and turning it into something you do for money means that you're never going to be able to relax again. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> because the thing you do for it is your job. Yeah. Uh, what is it like, honestly, to have turned part of your identity into your job, for lack of a better means? I mean, you must always be on. You know what I mean? It must It must just get mentally exhausting, God. Well, you know, first of all, I don't get paid for any of the advocacy work I do. It's all volunteer. Um, Thank you. I do, um, you know, I'm a global speaker, so I get to, to, I mean, outside of the pandemic, I'm still getting speaking gigs abroad, but they're on Zoom yep. um, or they're online. But, um, you know, those types of things, obviously, um, I get paid for, but, um, you know, my advocacy work, all volunteer, walking across the island, volunteer, all that stuff is volunteer. Um, and that's, and that's fine with me. You know, um, I do a really cool, um, I have a really cool paid job, which is executive director of Air Force, formerly for the level of learning, which um, helps young people um, get working back to school um, through arts projects. So that I love. Um, my advocacy work, like I said, um, you know, turned into my life's work in that um, I do love doing it. I think, you know, I was born with a fire in my belly. So for me, I feel like um, I'm not sure at this point if there's any separation between Gem of the Advocate and Gem of the Individual. I feel like, um, you know, things happen. And as a result of that, I'm like, this is wrong and something needs to change. And so then I just go for it. I'm a doer and um, a creative thinker, but I'm also um, a strategist, you know? And so sometimes with things you need to play the long game. And I have, um, for example, conversion therapy. I went to see a conversion therapist as a kid, oh. uh, tried to uh, kill myself as a result, attempted suicide, survived, had to go to hospital, got out of hospital and vowed to devote the rest of my life to help kids who were struggling with sexuality and gender identity. And so at the time, um, I got involved uh, on campus, running a, a resource center for um, queer youth, um, and that kind of launched me into activism. Yep. And at the time, um, when I tried to get going on raising awareness about conversion therapy, no one believed it existed back then. So there was no political will. So instead, I focused on other, other issues, like, for example, same-sex marriage, the blood ban, um, more recently, gender neutral documentation, uh, these types of things in order to build a political will in order to get societal recognition to revisit this type of harmful theory, okay. therapy. Yeah. And so that was, that was, that was, you know, I played the long game there. And finally this past year, um, you know, we were able to get it banned. And I was up in Ottawa. I was invited up by the Minister of Justice and I did a press conference. I was there for the, for the tabling of the bill and the passing. And it was, it was incredible to, to be there to, to see um, my life come full circle because conversion therapy is what actually turned me into an advocate. And, um, you know, I feel like uh, it's just been a long road, but because of the same sex uh, because of same-sex marriage, because of um, other um, causes I've been fighting for within the LBGTQ2 plus community, and I've been doing a lot of media over the years, other people have reached out to me. And we formed a network of people who have survived conversion therapy. And it was just a wonderful day, um, you know, last Friday to to see it be banned to see that now uh, conversion therapy is illegal in our country and so um still a lot of work to be done but you know what we're getting there and uh so for me i think i'm an advocate to my core you know yeah. and um when there's injustice i'm gonna fight for it um i don't find it exhausting per se i find it energizing Good. Um, and because I've learned to practice self-care over the years, 
um, you know, by talking to a therapist when I need to, knowing my own personal limits. Like I'm a sexual abuse survivor, so I practice boundaries. You know, I've had to learn boundaries and how to take care of myself and, and, and what's good, what's not. Um, you know, I, I do cold water swimming. I lift weights. Um, these are the types of things that, um, you know, help me do what I need to do. And, and, um, and, and, and that's it. You know, I, I just, uh, I don't know any other way to be really yeah. because I love this type of work. Um, it brings me, I think it helps me heal from the traumas of the past. Um, and, um, you know, and I feel like I feel a strong sense of social responsibility. So if there's something that I can do, then I, I, I have to do it. That's, that's how I feel like, you know, it's interesting that we're having this discussion today because, um, today is the five year anniversary of when I had top surgery Oh, and, and um, my grandmother, uh, passed away five years ago, just before I went up to Ontario, um, for my top surgery. So my yes, that I, was in the story. Yes, yes. You know, my mother and I went to um, to Ontario together and, you know, my family were like, we need to, we still need to go. This is what Nan would want. And uh, so we did. And then coming back from Ontario, um, because at that point I had, um, my name was Gemma. Yep. And I was presenting masculine. There was confusion at the airport, which caused my mother anxiety and questions about my IDs and questions about if I was seated in the right place. And that experience, that experience I use as a teaching moment, you know, with the, the staff of, of uh, the airline mm-hmm. and they were all very apologetic. But then from that experience, I got home and I wrote airlines and I did media and eventually gradually airlines had changed and then also um i started my case against the um province here to get gender neutral identification based on that experience yeah. um you know i had been thinking about it and working on it for some time but you know these types of things that happen to me um i think to myself um i can handle it but yeah. what about kids that can't what about yeah. kids who are more vulnerable than me or, you know, don't have the, have the support in their family or, you know, society needs to, to, to move forward. So someone's got to do this and, and, and I'm going to do it, you know? So that experience on the airline, um, you know, letter writing campaigns, I'm all about them. Nice. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like just a small incident turned into to something with big results, you know? And, um, and so therefore I, I don't really know if I think it's just me, it's just who I am. Um, and so, uh, you know, those types of experiences are unfortunate, of course, because I know it caused my mom, uh, some stress, um, and it was uncomfortable for me. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I used it to, um, to create change. Light a fire under yourself to kind of, you know, burn yeah burn the bs down for lack of a better word you can't burn bs oh well whatever we, we did that would just that would just make it worse but you know what i mean yeah yeah I totally do. absolutely yeah what is the most difficult part of your artistic process finding the time to write yeah that makes sense um you know i'm pursuing a master's part-time i'm working full-time and I'm doing a lot of advocacy work. And, you know, you really need the space to, I need to separate myself from all that other stuff in order to get in the mind frame to write. So I almost need to take a couple of days and just be out of nature and then kind of sink into the writing. Um, so I'm also very deadline motivated. So for me, um, when I do find the time to write, I can get going on it. but it's it's really finding the time where I'm not focused on anything but writing. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Right Project podcast, Gemma. That is wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Uh, please check out Almost Feral and Land of Many Shores and anything Gemma should happen to be involved with. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. All right. 
All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. For all of you, we'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.